Thank you all for coming today. It's great to see all of your faces, and thank you to CNCF for having us. Yeah, uh, it's awesome. We're going to get into our journey about building a database as a service. Before, we do have a few questions. How many of you have managed a database before? Nice. <laughs> cool. All right, so how many of you have managed a database in the cloud before? OK, probably the same amount. And how many of you have managed a database in Kubernetes? Nice. Yeah. All right, less but reasonable. Reasonable. <laughs> All right, who are we? I'm Abhi Vaidyanatha. I am a software engineer at PlanetScale, and when I'm not writing closed source software for them, I'm probably DJing. My name's Lucy Burns. I'm a product manager at PlanetScale, and when I'm not working, I write poetry about the environment. And up here, you'll also see the whole PlanetScale team who worked on this project with us. Cool, so we're gonna have our nice little minimalistic agenda for us today. Uh, first, we're gonna define the problem. As we said, uh, stateful workloads in a stateless environment is very difficult. Offering this as a service is even more difficult, so we're gonna kind of go through the historical journey of how we got there and then go into how we attack the problem. Yeah, so we'll talk about choosing the technology for our database as a service. We decided to go all in on open source and we'll explain that decision and talk about the projects we chose and the challenges we faced there. And then we'll uh, describe the integration challenges and uh, explain how everything fit together. So uh, if you were able to catch the awesome talk uh, by Slack's uh, engineers, Rafael and Guido, you were able to uh, kind of get into this idea of immutable infrastructure. So uh, before we had immutable infrastructure, uh, we had these wonderful, like, spicy deployments that you really didn't know or what, were, uh, what was being deployed in production, and um, stuff was really, what well, was non-deterministic and needed to be updated and modified in place. Now, um, we know that it, at a small scale, manually updating and modifying your uh, infrastructure in place is not that hard, but as it grows out, it becomes very difficult. However, we ran into one issue. Um, the issue is that redeploying infrastructure is expensive. So as cloud providers kind of figured out how to make redeploying infrastructure be automated, be quick, and to figure out persistence uh, with, with new and old infrastructure, these problems started to go away. And containers solved the issue of, being, of new deployments being deterministic. And uh, Kubernetes solved the issue of immutable infrastructure being able to scale. So now we're in this place where we have our applications in Kubernetes, we're receiving all the benefits that Abi described, and now we come to the question of what do I do with my databases? Um, and at first this question might be, feel a little antithetical. Do I really want to run stateful workloads in a stateless environment? And in fact, most experts recommend that you don't do that. And that's because you can't take the longevity of your pod in which your master is running for granted. It might go down, and worst case, you might lose data, or else you might just experience downtime. So we have this problem. And we saw this problem as an area for opportunity, and we wanted to see if there was a way we could tackle these challenges and provide the benefits of Kubernetes for a database. So as with any hard problem comes a very uh, strict form of a strict outline for what we want from our product. So we're going to uh, define what it means to be cloud native because we feel that a cloud native database has all of these really important qualities and you're able to trust a cloud native database with your, with your data. The first thing and arguably the most important thing is reliability. Fault tolerance is uh, incredibly important and whether you're losing a pod, a node, a replica, a master, a data center, your customer should not see it at all. It should be absolutely transparent. Uh, next, uh, automation, all of, uh, all of your res resource provisioning and your convergence to your expected state should be completely hands off. You guys have all managed databases, it sounds like, so you know at a certain point you'll hit the question of scale. So whether you start small and grow big and want to scale out, or if your application sees traffic spikes from events like Black Friday or a Padres game or some other event, you want to be able to scale up and scale down as you need. Additionally, we want to be able to treat our database system as one entity, even though there may be moving parts behind it. We want something that's logically singular in place of some, in, 
What we don't want is multiple levels of architecture kind of duct taped together with custom code. We want one entity. So then we get to anti-horticulturism. So uh, you guys are all familiar with the pets versus cattle analogy of the fact that you don't want to be uh, managing and tending to pets and you want to be able to treat your infrastructure as cattle. It's 2019, so we have a plant-based analogy now. Uh, we want to use the, the analogy versus uh, gardens and row crops. So if you think about a garden, you have your little tomato plant. You care about that tomato plant. Like You, you tend to it, you care for its life. Uh, when you go over to uh, row crops, you care about the overall performance of all of your crops. Everything can be deleted and, and brought up again at, at will, and you just essentially want, like, and you, you don't care about any individual plant. So, of course, the product manager in me was like, great, we've defined what we want. How do we build the minimum viable product? How do we scale this project down to the bare necessity? And what we realized really quickly is a database is such a fundamental part of your um, infrastructure that you can't really scale it down that easily. You do want to have monitoring and alerts and scaling and all of these other things. There's actually a really big surface area for just creating a standard database. It's sort of like if you wanted to bring a car to the market, but you didn't want to have wheels for it. That just wouldn't go. So uh, the way I like to describe it is if we have our, if we rate our database as a service product and uh, from one being a like enterprise piping to DevNull and uh, 10 is a fully functioning cloud native database as a service, we have to release at a 10 and then develop uh, quality of life features to a 15. So we decided that a no compromise product was uh, absolutely the way to go. Sorry about that. So how are we going to get there? We have this huge task ahead of us. At Planet Scale, we decided to go all in on open source technology for a few different reasons. First of all, some of the technology we were looking at that was open source had been developed for the container ecosystem, which made it a perfect fit for what we were trying to create. Additionally, we knew the software had been created by motivated contributors, contained bleeding edge technology, and was of a very high quality, and we wanted to use that. Additionally, it gave us the opportunity to participate in the open source community, which is something we find really valuable. And again, we didn't want to have to build everything ourselves. We already had a big project ahead of us. So we recognize that there are some drawbacks to open source. And if you, if you want a specific feature in your favorite open source products to, be, to exist, you have to spend your own developer's time uh, going and writing that feature. Now the thing is, as Lucy said, we actually view this as an opportunity. We love engaging with the open source community, and we feel that from cont contrib contributing back and from helping out the communities, we can actually create more support and kind of pick out the two, uh, the two other issues uh, that people have with op open, source, uh, open source products, which is usually longevity and guaranteed support for their product. So we define the problem statement as building a database as a service for Kubernetes. But one of the reasons we really decided to go forward and pursue this problem is because of the flexibility of deployment that Kubernetes enables. We wanted to take our database as a service and deploy it in AWS, deploy it in GCP, deploy it in any cloud provider, or deploy it even in someone's own Kubernetes infrastructure. Uh, additionally, you're going to be having lots of different types of resources, and you don't, you shouldn't, and care about what kind of resources you have. You should, Kubernetes allows us to schedule across all different kinds, kinds of compute, which is really convenient for us. In addition to that, uh, they, uh, Kubernetes allows you to create really flexible networking topologies. Uh, when, we, when we expose our MySQL endpoint, Kubernetes handles all of the load balancing and all of the routing for us instead of us having to manage that service manually, which is, this is imperative for us, especially as a service. So Vitess lies at the heart of our database as a service. In fact, PlanetScale was created to, to provide a larger audience for Vitess. For those of you who aren't familiar with Vitess, it was created in 2010 at YouTube to help YouTube through, scale through its hypergrowth period. Today it sees production traffic from companies like Slack, Square, JD.com, and many more. Um, Vitess is a great database management system because it offers observability, monitoring, permissions, and you can scale horizontally. 
Additionally, it was created for Borg at Google, which was the blueprint for Kubernetes. So in a way, you could say that Vitesse was Kubernetes ready before Kubernetes existed, and that was perfect for us. Vitesse also lies above MySQL, so you don't have to do a trade-off between scale and a relational database. Additionally, you're not using a new database, so you don't have to worry about unknowns. Everyone knows sort of the, the pain points, the highs and lows of MySQL. So, okay, we like Vitesse, but Vitesse can be a really big challenge to configure. And what we wanted to do was to take our in-house expertise and create an opinionated package that people could use out of the box. This naturally led us to a database as a service. Once we decided that, okay, we're gonna have a database as a service for Vitesse, we ran into our first challenge. Vitesse is designed to manage one large distributed system with shared infrastructure. Now we wanted to run hundreds of large distributed systems with shared infrastructure. And we had to make sure we could keep data from company one outside of data from company two. So how did we do this? We decided to rely on the isolation provided by containers to write a lot of different network policies and to use RBAC. And so a lot of the challenge here was writing out those network policies and then making sure we felt confident that no one from company one would see data from company two. And once we achieved that, we kind of moved on to the next challenge, which, challenge, which is what is the best way to bring up the tests? So uh, operators. Operators are cool. Uh, they allow you to specify something with YAML, config, and then sp spit out, well, exactly what you want. Uh, I, I, this is really cool because a lot of them exist in open source for all of your favorite open source products. Uh, but there isn't, a, a, there isn't a really solid one for Vitesse, so we had to write one ourselves. Uh, we spent a lot of time writing our first version of our Vitesse operator, which uh, spun up all of our different database components, but we did it on a really old version of the operator SDK, and while the operator SDK is fantastic, we, it, it had like progressed a lot. Uh, it, it had progressed a lot since then, and had breaking changes that we were kind of stuck to. So we made the choice to completely rewrite our operator, and that was probably one of the best choices we ever made because the new operator, uh, the new op versions of the operator SDK, have the new controller runtime, which basically improved our deployment speed by like 80 percent, and it has auto, uh, access to auto-generated documentation. So definitely take advantage of that if you're planning on developing uh, developing your own operator. It is absolutely fantastic. Now, that being said, uh, we couldn't use operators for everything. Uh, while the etcd operator is really good, it has a lot of really cool features such as uh, recovery and auto scaling. Uh, we were finding that it was not actually possible for us to, to recover from, cor uh, from a loss of quorum unless we took backups all the time. Now the thing is, is that etcd with Vitesse serves one purpose, it has one contract, and that's to essentially tell where everything is. We store uh, our sharding scheme, we store like how, we, like, how you're sharding, where your, where your uh, databases are, and uh, what your serving graph looks like in etcd. We rely on consistency and not necessarily for, uh, with performance for this. So we actually don't necessarily need high availability on this. We simply just, we, we simply just need it to work. So what we did is instead of using the etcd operator, we used our Vitesse operator to bring up etcd clusters as staple sets which with each uh, database that we provisioned, and we backed all of those with persistent volumes, so uh, we actually didn't have to worry about taking backups for our etcd instances anymore. Uh, additionally, uh, monitoring school, you need it for any database product. Uh, thankfully, we have the de, de facto cloud native uh, monitoring uh, available to us through open source. Uh, Prometheus is awesome. It is well accepted in many different uh, many different pieces of software. Uh, Prometheus is um, it, you, so through lots of different pieces of uh, pieces of software. It is natively integrated by the, with the slash metrics and, uh, endpoint. Uh, or a lot of companies are, or uh, pieces of software run it as a uh, sidecar process. So uh, because, because it's so uh, well known, it was kind of like uh, a natural progression for us to use it. Uh, additionally, um, Prometheus is really nice uh, in terms of the UI. It's very clear what your configuration is. As someone who wants to know exactly how, like, uh, 
how my, uh, my infrastructure is, uh, is configured. Uh, if you just go straight into the Prometheus UI, click on config, it tells you exactly what services you're trying to discover, how many targets you have, and whether you're actually discovering them. Uh, so it's really, it's really convenient. It looks beautiful. And uh, finally, uh, the kind of one of the interesting challenges that we had uh, with, uh, with Prometheus was actually configuration. The Prometheus operator works fantastic, and that's actually how we deploy uh, Prometheus when, you, uh, when we specify monitoring in our, uh, our top-level CRD. Uh, we talk to the Prometheus operator, which brings up Prometheus pods for us. However, there's a lot of, uh, there, there's a lot of configuration that needs to go with it, and we kind of just went around Google and Stack Overflow and kind of just put together this like configuration Frankenstein, which looked really messy. But then we realized that if you go to, if you go to the CoreOS uh, GitHub repository, there's something called cube-prometheus, uh, which actually allows you to auto-generate all of that configuration for you. So don't, don't do what we did. Uh, go and uh, get, that, get that manifest with um, pin dependencies for you. So if you have Prometheus, you're going to want Grafana. Grafana pulls metrics from Prometheus and visualizes them in graphs. And while you could argue that Grafana isn't an MVP requirement technically because it's not in the serving path, if you're planning on running production traffic, you're going to want to have Grafana so that you can see what's happening with your databases. The good news is that Grafana can be auto-provisioned, so we were able to bake it into our Vitesse operator, and that was actually pretty easy to do. So as you're kind of uh, figuring out, our Vitesse operator is the lifeblood for, uh, for our product. It, it spins out everything, including our Grafana pod, which immediately pulls in the data source uh, from Prometheus. Now, when, when, how do we expose that Grafana dashboard to the user? So we have a Grafana link, in our database as a service. This request, when you click on that link, is then sent to a level seven application load balancer. Then we send it to our authentication proxy. Uh, we use OpenResty for our authentication proxy. Fantastic, lightweight, it uses Lua, which is scriptable, lots of, lots of libraries available for it. And because it's so scriptable, we were able to integrate it with the Kubernetes API really easily. And it's just an overall fantastic product. So what did we actually build? How do all of these projects come together? So uh, here's our uh, wonderful architecture diagram. As you can see, the planet scale operator is kind of the, the, the core of it that spins out uh, all, the, all the stuff that we need. Uh, when you get an API request, it comes in the form of a planet scale cluster CRD. Like we said, when we're building out a cloud native database, we want our things to be logically singular. Everything lives under this planet scale cluster CRD. Uh, the planet scale cluster CRD change, or the, uh, any, whether it's a create, update, delete, is sent to Kubernetes, which, which then passes it over to the planet scale operator, which is in charge of reconciling that planet scale cluster. That planet scale cluster then spins up all of the required components. It'll spin up all of the all, all of Vitesse and its subcomponents. If you want to learn more about that, we have lots of talks about Vitesse. Uh, we th we then spin up our Prometheus pod which then is autumn, and, and then we make sure to spin up Grafana after that, which then captures the Prometheus data source, and then we spin up our authentication proxy, which, uh, which allows us to link to Grafana and to, other, uh, to our stats pages that, are, that come packaged with Vitesse. In addition, we spin up, uh, like we said, with our operator, we also spin up our etcd clusters for our topology metadata store, and we have a backup process that, that makes sure to capture backups in the case of data loss. Okay, but what does this look like in real life? We're gonna show you what we built, and oh boy, hopefully I can get you to it. And you can try this out yourself if you would like. Um, the URL is console.planetscale.com. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is create a cluster when I do this, I am spinning up all of the Vitesse architecture that we talked about. I can also choose the platform and the region that I would like to deploy in. I'll choose AWS US, US East. So that spins up the cluster. And the next thing I need to do is spin up the actual database, the MySQL clusters with the VT tablets on top. I'll just call this database test one. Um, we can see it's a single region deployment. Here I can add additional resources, whether it's CPU, RAM, or storage. 
I can decide on the number of instances for high availability. I always like to have three. And then here's the really fun part that Vitesse offers. I can go ahead and deploy an uncharted database, so it's just a MySQL instance, or I can start out sharded and create a sharding scheme that will route my queries to the correct shard and gain scale through doing that. It generally takes about two to four minutes to deploy our debate to deploy our database depending on how many replicas you're using. So what I've done is created another one that we can take a look at so we don't have to waste our time on that. So here you have a deployed database. You can see how long it's been running. Um, I created it right before this demo. And the thing that I wanted to show you is the Grafana dashboard. I've been writing to this database so we can see my queries per second and then we can see some other insights about the tests. So that's how our database looks in real life. Let's go back to our presentation. Oh yeah, one, one piece that I um, forgot, just um, the way that you go ahead and connect to this database is right here. We provide a MySQL connection string that you can just copy and paste into your terminal and get started from there. Quick, quick review of everything we've done. There'll be a test afterward. <laughs> All right, so was that hard? Yeah, yeah, it was. It, it was. it was pretty hard, but the thing is that not for the reasons that we thought it was. We thought it would be hard to create a database as a service because we'd have to create all of the internals and create all of the, like, kind of the, the lifeblood of the, pro of the product, but the real answer was it was a lot of meta infrastructure that we had to build around. There, we had to basically provide a reliable and, trust, and trustworthy database to solve a problem that a lot of people had, are, that uh, consider has never been solved before. Uh, we, have to, we are in an environment where stuff is expected to go down. We have to persist your, persist your data, serve traffic in, an, in a very dangerous environment. And we understand that uh, Network boundaries are hard, RBAC is hard, reconciliation is hard, uh, consistency is hard, and just overall configuration is, is kind of a difficult thing. But our, basically the main functionalities and all of the, and, and all like the really cool things that, that, that we use to serve our product isn't hard because, a lot, because we have so many really cool open source offerings. And, it's honestly really cool that there's that it's it's honestly just really cool that like that we're able to kind of just take a bunch of uh, a bunch of stuff from open, uh, from open source, especially Vitesse, which is an incredibly high functioning product, and kind of integrate it into a full offering. So where are we going next? What do we want to add now that we have this base level cloud native database? So, like I said. This is a problem that a lot of people consider is not solved yet. Uh, we want to show people, with I guess, through our database as a service, or just through the, op the open source Vitesse Slack, through the community, show people that you can do this, and we want to talk to people and help and, and kind of evangelize the fact that like that it is very possible Vitesse was built to do this, and that this problem is soon going to become a thing of the past. On the product side, we want to offer something that we've been calling BYOK, or bring your own Kubernetes, so that you can take our database as a service software and hook directly into your Kubernetes deployment and deploy your databases there. We're really excited about that. Additionally, we want to build out the functionality for a true multi-cloud cluster. And what I mean by that is I want to be able to spin up a master in AWS and spin up replicas in GCP and have the master and replicas communicate across cloud platforms. Uh, currently, the way that horizontal scale works, it, it's kind of a, it, it is a manual process, but it's something that we can absolutely automate. The time will come where we, can, where we will be able to use the test performance characteristics to automatically shard your database for you and to keep up with your, uh, with your ever-growing company. Cool, so we, we kind of rushed over a lot of the functionality that Vitesse provides. If you're interested in learning more, there are a few more talks. Um, one today at 3.20, coming up soon, um, and some on Wednesday and Thursday. And I think we're ready for questions now.
So I have two questions. Uh, one question is, uh, are there any companies today who are using Vitesse in Kubernetes? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, JD.com uh, is using Vitesse in Kubernetes, um, and they have a very huge deployment going. Um, I think it was mentioned in the keynote. And also HubSpot, <laughs> I forgot about HubSpot as well. Could you speak a little bit more about the operator? Uh, how, does it, how does that work and what happens when a new client creates a new cluster? Is it like an entire Vitesse full cluster for them or is there some different kind of segmentation at the level of key spaces, sales? Uh, so the operator, like when 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 someone goes into our database as a service and creates and creates a cluster, we we just we create, like I said, we have that top level planet scale cluster, uh, uh, cluster object, which then goes and which then and goes and creates the uh, actually sub level, uh, the sub level objects, which are uh, which are it actually creates objects called Vitesse cells and Vitesse clusters and Vitesse key spaces. And uh, we actually, uh, so uh, good question, because we actually just spent a lot of time open sourcing the main, comp main components of the operator. And uh, very shortly, um, e everyone will be able to use our open source Vitesse operator to deploy, uh, to, to deploy Vitesse clusters on Kubernetes. And, and so and everything in the serving path will be completely open source. I think you briefly mentioned multi-tenancy. Uh, can you talk a bit more about how you guys handle that? Um, sorry, can you repeat the question? Uh, yeah, can you guys talk a bit more about how you guys handle multi-tenancy in your use case? Uh, multi-tenancy? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, we're, I mean, right now, uh, well, right right now, multi-tenancy is simply it is not something that we currently uh, currently sort, but it's on our he's, roadmap. He's talking right? about just running. So we use yeah. our Kubernetes deployment to run different companies' right. databases. Right. Yeah. yeah. Go for it. Yeah, we're gonna. Trial an expert. <laughs> So basically, each company gets its own etcd cluster. Um, so the metadata is stored there. Each company gets its own. Um, uh, so each company can have multiple clusters in, inside them, but company is a high-level object that is allocated to every tenant. And um, I'm trying to remember whether we put each company in a different namespace or not. But the intent is to put each company in a different namespace um, and have an etcd cluster associated with each company in which multiple Vitesse clusters that that company creates can live. So that's how we are handling multi-tenancy. So it's the same overall Kubernetes clusters and all the data is living, but it's different namespaces. Does that answer your question? Uh, can you talk a little bit about like what type of underlying disk is used like for persistent storage and the IOPS and like read write throughput? Yeah. Um, I believe we use uh, we use M we use EBS for our for our persistent storage. EBS and AWS. Yeah. And the, uh, the IOPS, right? Like the what type of IOPS do you get from that disk? And you know, that's some of the challenges in stateful set is like you know, you use SSDs or like a regular disk which is slow and uh, just curious, you know, some of the de customer deployments, what, what kind of read write throughput you have? So in our database as a service, we use um, persistent storage which different cloud providers provide in their own implementation, abstracted through the Kubernetes uh, uh, persistent storage types, so PVCs and claims and per persistent volumes um, for durability. And whatever the typical characteristics in terms of 
uh, IOPS you get from them. That's what you, we surface to you. But VTES in general can be run in two different modes. Um, the one that I described we call uh, durability using disk. Um, but you can also run VTES uh, in a mode that Slack runs it that we call as network durability. And in that mode, there is one master, two replicas, and we configure MySQL to run with a semi-sync replication turned on, which means that the master does not acknowledge a particular commit as having succeeded until at least one of the replicas has all the data associated with that commit in its relay logs, right? So that's how we, and we use anti-affinity to make sure that your master pod and replica pods are not on the same host. Um, uh, thus, if the master pod goes away, we choose one of the replicas as the new master, which has all the data for committed transactions, and that's how you get network durability. That has some interesting characteristics because we don't need to flush to disk after every commit. So your write throughput actually goes up if you're running in that fashion. And if your master goes down, we just spin up a new replica which um, uh, instantiates itself from a backup. We save a GTID with every backup, and then it starts replicating as of that GTID from the master, and once it catches up, it joins the serving quorum. So that's the second type of durability, and Slack runs like that. Currently, the database as a service doesn't support that, but that's on the roadmap also. Any other questions? Hey, uh, I saw the slide that you guys had about using Open Resty for the uh, networking, traffic control, and such. I was wondering if you could go into a little more detail on how you guys do the traffic control, specifically uh, network traffic coming in off of a load balancer and then segmenting that up uh, to go to the actual customer instances. Specifically, are you guys able to do like layer four traffic control? Um, and if so, where do you guys do that? What, do, what does that topology look like? Um, I'll, try, I'll try to speak to that. Uh, so we, what, we, what we do with Open Resty is we, ev uh, for every customer in our database as a service, we assign them a JWT. And so what, what we do is we, we, we use the Kubernetes API to go and, to, to go and look at, their, at, at whether they have uh, at whether they have the, at what they provision what, and what, whether they have the correct permissions for it. And we'll, we see if that matches up with the claims in their JWT. So, so that, that's just, that's, mo that's mostly what's going on there. Uh, it, it, I don't know if that answers, answers your question or not, or? Yes, partially. Um, Specifically for getting the data or the traffic to the customer instances, as in the databases, is that what you guys are doing in that case as well? Um, I'm, I'm sorry. Can you repeat that, please? Yeah. The uh, so when customers are wanting to connect to mm -hmm. their instance, for example, the connection string that you demoed, um, how do you guys route that traffic? Oh, yeah, so to the actual customer. So instance? that's not so. So that's actually just that's com that's completely handled. Like, use that's using the application. Oh, it's a, oh, yeah. Huh. That, that path is not served by OpenBSD. Yeah. That, uh, you know, in the case, the actually uh, you know, implements the MySQL uh, authentication protocol and also PLS. So we actually start a set of VTGates. We start a set of VTGates per customer, and we also do a load balancer in front of those VTGates. And for, for each customer. So each customer connects to that uh, load balancer. And so in that path, OpenRest is not there. So we use OpenRest mostly for the web authentication. Yeah. I think we have uh, time for one more question. If Uh, so you guys used uh, Open S uh, sorry, Operator SDK. I was wondering if you had any thoughts or comparisons with uh, Cube Builder. Uh, comparisons to uh, Cube Builder. Uh, we we haven't we haven't evaluated Cube Building, so uh, so I'm sorry I wouldn't I okay, wouldn't, no I wouldn't be able Thanks. to talk to them. All right, thank you, everyone.